very much. Well, good morning. It's great to be here. Now, um, thank Pastor Johnny for his kind invitation. Um, I'm surprised you left Joe behind because I'm sure you can. There's the sort of place you'd love to be. And uh, he's already preached about, is it twice or three times? No, no, he's really working hard out there. But the thing is this, when Johnny comes back, Pastor Johnny comes back, he's going to ask you how I did this morning. Now, he's the old pastor do. He said, how did he get on? You know, so I'd like you to, can we agree now what we're going to say? Because, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a bit, a bit fragile at the moment, and I'm a bit nervous that you might. So why don't we agree? You're going to say, John said, oh, I didn't get on. Say, say, he was very good, Johnny, but not as good as you. <laughs> now, I'll be happy with that. And I think he'll be happy with that. Okay? So you remember that? So when he comes in, he was very good, John, but not as good as you. So that's very good. I've been wanting to plug him. We have a summer event, and it's called the Elam Festival for the whole family. It used to be very much a youth camp, but we've developed now into more of a family camp. There are other camps that seem to be focusing on youth. And it's the 26th of July to the 4th of August. And if you have a caravan or a tent, or you can borrow one or whatever, um, please come up and join us. It's up near, if I said Middlesbrough, you think, oh, well, I don't want to go to Middlesbrough. But we're south of Middlesbrough. Anybody here from Middlesbrough? Yeah. No, there isn't. You're just trying to worry me there. Yeah. And um, it's a great site overlooking some beautiful hills and uh, great facilities, a huge concrete barn, we've got flush loos, we've got showers, it really is, it's, it's, like, it's better than at home really actually, <laughs> so if you want to, please, there's some leaflets available for you, please take them, um, there's plenty for the kids to do, we do some studies, Mike Reed at Huddersfield and myself do a bit of teaching in the morning, and then we have some services in the evening, and then there's sports and all sorts of running around and things. Uh, but I don't think I'd interest any of you here um, <laughs> running around. So please take one and think about it. And it's very reasonably priced. You might want to come as a worker. It's either a little cheaper to come as a worker. But we, you know, we do that. So please do have that. I'm going to keep that one for me to remind me as I go around. It's true. In a, a few weeks' time at our conference, I'll be finishing being regional superintendent for the Midlands and North East. It seems very strange. It's come upon... It's, gone very quickly, very, very quickly indeed, and I appreciate your kindness. I don't think I've ever driven up here thinking, oh, you know, don't go to the sand, you know, I haven't. I always felt welcome. I think that I, ever, as I came in again, I was just so uh, gobsmacked, can I say that up here? Yeah. Yeah. Gobsmacked with what you've done with the building. I know you've got other work on, so congratulations to Johnny and the whole team that made that happen. So it, it really is a real credit to you and to the Lord Jesus. So thank you very much. Great. Well, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the letter of the Hebrews, chapter uh, chapter 4 of Hebrews. Now, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. Now, some of you might not know where Hebrews is. Use your index. Don't be nervous to look in your index. Because I know I'm in Yorkshire, so let me just say, you've paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you might want to use it, okay? If you start at Genesis and work your way to the back, I'll be finished before you get there. All right. So, Hebrews. We don't know who wrote the letter of the Hebrews. Some say Paul, some say Apollos. We really don't know. But as the, as the, um, the title says, it was written to converted Christian Jews in the main. But, of course, it has an application for all of us. And I'd like to turn you to chapter 4. I'm going to read from verse 12. Um, in fact, I'm not reading from verse... Yes, I'm reading from verse 12. Pardon me. For the word of God is living and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I will look at some verses a little later, further on, but I, I want to just pause there, look at that, and then come in with the other verses. I need to pray. Father, we thank you for a lovely gathering such as this, where we can come with one another and sing your praises. We can break bread together, and now we can listen to your word together. And we pray, Lord, that the same Holy Spirit that breathed this word into being might breathe upon the speaker and hearers alike. Amen. 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 Um, Billy Graham, who recently has passed away, um, you have a famous saying, he says, the Bible says, the Bible says, he was quite famous for it. I can remember one story about Billy Graham. 
when he came across to this country. Once he came on what was then the QE2, which was quite a, a, a flash ship. And when he got to Southampton and got off the boat, they said to him, do you think, um, you think God would be happy with you going on the QE2 when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey? And Billy Graham said, you get a donkey that'll swim the Atlantic, I'll get on it. <laughs> I thought, well, a good answer to give. A good answer to give. But Billy Graham used to say, the Bible, the way the, the Bible says. And you know, friends, you cannot have too much Bible in your life. And we don't worship the Bible. The Bible isn't there to be worshipped. We don't keep it in a box. We don't keep it hidden away. We don't have it behind a veil. This book is for sale in WH Smith's. You can go and buy a Bible in so many places. So it's not the book itself, but it's the Word of God. And the writer of the Hebrews reminds them here, it says, the Word of God is living and active. My Word is not living and active. And your Word, no matter how inspired you might feel you are, is not the Word of God. The Word of God is the Word of God. Now the Word of God is active. So what about a prophetic Word? A prophetic Word is subject to the written Word. So if you're, quote, prophesying, and you say something that's contrary to the Bible, we're not going to believe you, we're going to believe the Bible. That's our, our test of it. That sounded a bit harsh, but really, that's it. So the writer's coming in, he's been talking about the rest in God, about the Sabbath, and he starts to talk about the Word of God is living and active. The reason the Word of God, the Bible, is living is because it comes from a living God. Hebrews 3, verse 12. Our God is alive. And this book was God breathed, the scripture said. So when the writer who wrote the book of Genesis was making the notes, he was, it was God breathed. When whoever wrote about Jonah, God breathed. The Psalms, the Gospels, it was God breathed. And so the authorship of this book is none other than God. It says the word of God is living because the one who brought it into being is a living God and as Phil reminded us, and is still living today. So this book's important. It should be very much part of our lives. Mm -hmm. Now, please, the, I'm not advocating that you read the Bible for an hour every day. Some it would be better if you read it for two minutes and understood it than read it for hours and hours and forgot the lot. I must remember that when I'm preaching. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so he comes in and he sets a foundation here. He says, this book, this word, the word of God is living because it comes from a living God. Secondly, he says, it's active. In other words, you can read many books, and I listen to a lot of books in the car. I travel quite a bit in the car, and I'll get books out of the library, and I'm coming home from Sunderland one Sunday night, maybe. I'll put my CDs on, and before I know it, I'm home, because I've been listening to this book. Um, but that, that's not active. The story might be good. There might be of intrigue in it. It might, you know, it'll keep me alert. It'll help the hours pass. But I've never listened to any book that I've got out of the library that has changed my life. Yeah. I've found them interesting. i found them, you know, curious in many ways. But the Bible is unique because it's active. It's active in a way because it's not only living, but it's active. It's not a passive book. Mm. When you read scripture, you can expect God to speak to you. You can expect God to change your life. Please, I'm not saying that every time you pick up your Bible, God's going to speak to you. That somehow you come away thinking, oh, what a revelation, and write it down and preach a sermon. No, no, no. But the great thing about Scripture is this, that even though we may not come away thinking God spoke to me, it's still active. It has a cleansing process, and we'll look at that in just a moment. So the writer's setting down the scene here about the Word of God. It's the Word of God, not yours or mine, the Word of God is, first of all, it's alive, it's a living, it should be part of our lives, and it's active. And then he tells us how the Word of God is active. In other words, it's not just a good story. There is a great story. He says the Word of God is active, sharper, right, I'll get this, sharper than any double-edged sword. Now you'll know that this is part of the Roman world, the double-edged sword was a sword that a Roman soldier would have. Now, I can't imagine, just as in the British Army, if you didn't keep your rifle clean, you'd be in trouble. I would think if you didn't keep your sword sharp in the Roman Army, you'd be in trouble. Because, literally, it was a weapon, it was to be used. And he comes and he looks and he searches 
for some picture that would help them understand just how effective. The, and he thought, well, what's the sharpest thing around? A Roman sword, a soldier's sword. Today we might talk about a bullet or a rifle or a gun. He used the sword. He says there very simply, sharper than any double-edged sword. So when we pick our Bible, we've got to be aware that the Bible's intention is to get inside us. Now please, there's a lot of uh, understanding, a lot of intellect, a lot of history, a lot of poetry. That's fine. Not everything, as it were, would penetrate our hearts. But we've got to understand that when we read this book, we are exposing ourselves to God intervening in our hearts. There's times we will read the Bible and our attitudes and our behaviour will be highlighted. You know, if I was to say today there's someone in this room who's a rat bag, you'd probably think I know who that is. <laughs> but if you're reading your Bible on your own, and God says there's a rat bag here, and you look around and there's no one else, the Bible's talking about you. Now, I'm sure you're not a rat bag at all, but it's there. And that's why we should read our Bible on our own. Because when we read the Bible on our own, God can speak to us about our hearts. God can divine. God can speak to us. And I'd rather God talk to me about my failures and my sins on my own than you've been around. And I'm sure you'd be the same. The privacy of Scripture is so very good. Well, the journey continues a little bit. The Word of God is the Word of God. It's living. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing of soul and spirit. In other words, what the Bible does when it enters, what God's Word does when it enters is, it, it, it separates even the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Now, your marrow is inside your bone. So, you know, he's saying here, this, this sword, God's Word will come right through to the very heart of things. Yes, amen. The very heart of things. And when we're a bit off guard, when we let things slip, for if it's the Word of God that will bring us back, the Holy Spirit will use God's Word to bring us back and to remind us of how we should live. If I tell you how to live, you will think, who's he to tell me? But God's Word says, you've got to stop. So, for example, if you're robbing banks at the moment, the Bible tells you to stop. Phil will probably say after the offering. <laughs> but, I mean, um, I think that's not very fair for me, Phil, saying that. You've got to stop. There's no debate. We don't pray about it. So, well, I'm going to pray about this. Thou shalt not steal. I'm robbing banks. Hmm, I wonder what God's really saying. So, I'm not sure the Bible is clear. The Ten Commandments are very clear. There's no negotiations. There's no 11. If you manage to keep the 10, well, you'll never keep the 10. And we'll come to that in a little moment. So when we pick up this book and we read it, not every time will the sword come. Not every time will our soul and spirit be separated. You know, there's a whole debate really about the matter of soul and spirit. You know, it divides. In other words, soul is my personality. The spirit is the, the Holy Spirit is in me who's regenerated my spirit. I'm now alive in Christ. And it says the Word of God can divide the two. And that's the problem with me. The problem with me is that there's too much Gordon and not enough Jesus. Would anybody say amen to that? Yeah. Too much Gordon, not enough Jesus. Does that mean I'm, I'm finished? I've got to resign? No, no, no. Work in progress. In fact, the fact I've said it gives hope there may be improvement on the way <laughs> if you acknowledge the challenge. And the Bible comes in and divides in that way. I remember when I first became a Christian, and uh, the man who counseled me has recently just passed away the night I became a Christian. I can remember my pastor saying to me, keep sweet, Gordon. Keep sweet. He could see in me something that shouldn't be there. Keep sweet. And those words echo. Just when I feel like going to war, I think, no, keep sweet, Gordon. There's another way to deal with this. And, uh, and it's not weakness. It's, it's hopefully some sign of spirituality in that sense. So please, don't avoid your Bible. Say, so, well, God, what, what, where are you getting to? I'll get there in a minute. But if you go home and start to read your Bible again, that would be great. So, well, I haven't got the time. Let me tell you now. Why don't you just, you know, I mean, praying at traffic lights is a great idea. <laughs> Think about how often you sat at traffic lights and run through a list. You know, you might be stuck at four traffic lights a day. There's four prayers. Lord, we just pray for the family now. Go. But don't close your eyes because... 
What happens? All the cars will go. Do. My wife has this great habit that if I'm slow yeah. off, she will remind me, green. You know, but it's very hard when you've got your eyes closed and you've got your hands in the air singing so that majesty at the Derby Ring Road. It doesn't go down well, especially part of the Derby Ring Road is very Muslim and I don't think they like the idea of that. But there we have it. But pick up your Bible again. Start to read it. You say, oh, my Christian life isn't the way it used to be. I think about what used to be. You know this, this golden age of your Christian life? What's changed? And I will say, I think you'll probably say that time when you were closest to God, you were close to your Bible. Does it mean read the Bible? Some people read the Bible through in a year. Some tell you, it's not what it's about. The point is letting God speak to us. Well, we go on a little bit further. It says there in verse 12 again, that it judges and the marrow. And then it says it judges, oh dear. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now that's what it does. It judges the thoughts and attitudes not of the mind, of the heart. I mean, I've got a lot of daft ideas God's not bothered about. I actually think Derby County should be in the Premiership. <laughs> well, there's a daft thought, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I thought you'd say that up here. Hull are now safe, so I'll be getting the pudding today. You know, um, you know it's, it's a daft thought, because it's not a heart thought. But my heart, where my affections are, where my idols may be. So I'd love to get out and make more room for Jesus and so the word of God and it judges let me get this there judges the the um, the thoughts and attitudes of the heart what do you think the Bible would say to you about the your attitude and thoughts of your heart where would the Bible speak would he would the Bible say to you you forgive people too slowly see all of us forgive people eventually because sooner or later we're going to get convicted and do it. It's how quickly we forgive. You know, how quickly we, we attend church maybe. Attending church, oh you say to me attending church is, no, attending church is a sign of a healthy Christian. And if you want to have a row afterwards, I will on that one. <laughs> it really is. Neglect not the assembling of yourselves together as you see the return of Jesus coming. Well, I'll tell you this, he's a lot nearer than he was in the book of Acts. Yeah. Coming. I don't know when he's coming. But you know, we live in exciting days. <coughs> when I first became a Christian, my pastor was from this area. He, he worked at a mission, a brethren mission in Batley, I believe it was. And he got the sack when he started to speak in tongues. Uh, or in, in that area. And then he became the seventh of pastor. And uh, he used to teach us. Do you know, my pastor it was, knew his Bible so well. When... Some of you don't remember, you remember the Six Day War? When Israel and the, all the, the Arab countries decided to push Israel back into the sea, that's what they were going to do. And, and do a bit of a Dunkirk, get them off. And my pastor was on holiday. And I may have said this somewhere else, I'm just in my heart at the moment. And he, um, he was on holiday, and I used to go to the prayer meeting. But I used to go after, it was on a Thursday, so I went after Top of the Pops. Because <laughs> we won't remember Top of the Pops, but, you know, I, I was trendy once. <laughs> I was a mod, I had a Lambretta TV 175. <laughs> you know, I, I was at Brighton in 65 when we took the rockers on. The trouble is I was with my dad watching it. Um, you know, I wasn't involved in it. But, you know, I, you see, and there was a postcard. There was a postcard from the pastor. It just said, have a nice time, hope you're all well. We'll be over by the weekend. The Six Day War. Mm -hmm. Now when you're 16, 15, 16, and somebody tells you that this war that was supposed to be finishing Israel was going to be over by the weekend, and it was, as you know, it was six days, you stand up. He also said to us, because back then the common market was just starting. Yeah, have you ever heard of the common market in yeah. Europe? Is there, yeah. You've heard of it, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Anyway, uh, he said, don't worry about the common market. It was the seven hills of Rome. A lot of prophecy about him, interpretation. He said this. He said, Gog and Magog in scripture are in southern Russia. And he said, when you see Israel, Israel obviously is there, but you see um, Persia, Babylon and Russia together in the Middle East, that he thought that was a very important sign. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Russia, although it's quite obviously there, and we have Iran is Persia, and of course Iraq is Babylon. <coughs> and they're all in Syria at the moment. And Putin is sticking up for the guy, the, the fellow in charge of um, um, Syria at the moment, because he wants to have a major military base in Syria. Now, I'm not saying that this is the, the things are getting near, but in 1966, when your pastor, who could do no wrong in my eyes, says to you, look for Russia, look for this, and look for Syria, and Iraq, and Iran, and I suddenly think, I never thought I would see an air base, a big Russian air base in Syria. Never thought it would. It was unheard of in the 60s. But there it is. So what I'm saying is, your Bible is, should be read with your newspaper, one commentator yeah, said. Because in it we have prophecy, in it we have so much. And it's very, very exciting. So there we have it. It divides the soul into it, and it judges the thoughts on attitudes of the heart. May I say something here? Now, I don't know you well enough to be horrible to anybody. Um, <laughs> well, apart from Phil. <laughs> you are not a judge in this church. Did you know that? So oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mock a bit here. Nobody in particular. I've been in this church 3,000 years, and these young people today, they don't behave like we used to. No, they don't. <laughs> But hopefully they won't turn out like you either. <laughs> I remember going to the church, somebody said, Oh, tell that man to take his hat off. I said, Yeah, if you tell all the women to put one on. <laughs> you know, we can do this, this, you know, judge. Please, there's only one judge allowed in this church, and that is the Bible. Yeah. The Bible. Now you say, Well, what about the pastors and elders? Yeah, they take the Bible and they put it, they apply your situation to the Bible, and they might turn around and say to you, look, if you want to continue as a member of this church, you've got to pack that in. Because it's unacceptable to the Scripture. It's not unacceptable to them. It's unacceptable to the Scripture. So the Scripture is the only judge. The Scripture is the only critic allowed in this church. So, you mean I can't say I think the church is too hot? <laughs> Grow up. Yeah. If it's too hot, let us know. We're only too pleased to turn the eating down. Yes. Aren't we? Yes. Where's the treasurer? Yes. Right. We're only too pleased to turn the eating down. Yes. You know, well, I'm lucky, you know, I couldn't get parked. I had to park in Leeds to get the bus in this morning. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, but please, listen, just pray for a miracle, will you, somehow? You know, we're doing our best to get more parking. Of course we are. But criticism, judging, it's not your job. So, well, you know, I don't like that Gordon. That's fight allowed. You can still go to heaven and not like me. <laughs> you know? And I've got to tell you, I'm not thinking great things about you either. <laughs> so I'm making you smile. It's the Bible that judges the thoughts and the hearts. And the leaders should take the Bible and apply it. So they could come to you and say, Gordon, you know, you said this, this, we thought you were a bit harsh on someone. You know, the Bible says be kind. So there we are, got it. One of the fruits of the Spirit is kindness. So if I stop being kind and People have the Bible convicts me of it. So if you have a, if you're drawn, and we live in a society where, you know, the opinion poll, you know, that's ruined our country, the opinion poll. Do you know what? We're not, this is going to sound so terrible. The most important thing in this is not your opinion, friend. We value you. We love you. We'll do anything we can to help you. But just because you don't agree with the rest of us, there's not a lot we can do about it. Because in this room, if there's 60 people or 70 people, we've got 70 different ideas of where we should go on the church outing. Well, actually, you should come to Elam Festival camp. <laughs> there's only one idea. That was good. I got that in Phil. <laughs> okay, let's just move on a little bit. I'm watching the time. For the Word of God is living, judging the thoughts of the heart. Now, I, don't, I don't like the next bit. Do you ever find bits of the Bible you don't like? <laughs> I don't like this next bit. It says there, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Oh, oh dear. He sees everything about me. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You see, when you became a Christian, God dealt with your sin on the cross. Phil very, very clearly told us that this morning. Sin is dealt with. But we have the word here, an account. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight, right? Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes to whom we must give an account. 
And in 2 Corinthians 5, we're told that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In other words, the day is coming when I will stand before Christ and he will talk to me about my Christian life. He won't talk to me about yours. And he'll not talk to you about mine. We will all stand. And we have to give an account. And no doubt he'll say something like, well, Gordon, you should have been more patient, you should have been more kind. All the fruits of the Spirit, he will have said, I should have had more. He might say to me, Gordon, if you'd have prayed about that in 1974, I'd have answered that prayer, but you didn't bother talking to me, so you have to go through that bit of bother. I think there'll be a whole, a whole reminiscence of everything about my life. Mm -hmm. But my salvation is not in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. I'm still his child. Yeah. And we must give an account. And he's... This is in the, the Word of God. So as we bring our lives in line with God's Word, if you like, there's less for us to give an account for. So we look at the Ten Commandments. None of us have kept the Ten Well, I've never stolen, I've never committed up. No, no, no. But have you always been the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul? And all? No, of course you haven't. In fact, you weren't supposed to either. God set the bar so high in the Ten Commandments, He knew you would fail. And the reason he set the bar high to cause you to know you failed is that you might turn to Christ for his mercy and his forgiveness. If it was possible for any human being to keep the law of God, Jesus would not have had to die. He died because none of us could get there. Holy as you are, marvelous as you are, let me tell you what, you have failed to reach the standard. We have a Savior who has come to our rescue. Now at this moment I'm feeling a bit depressed about this. Let me move. So the word of God is living, it's dividing, it's judging my heart, my thoughts, everything's going to be open before God, he knows everything about me and I, I've got to, to whom we must give an account. And I've got to say it's almost like I'm going down, the sack is getting heavier on get my back. Oh, it's the word of God and it's dividing and it's judging and you know I've got a seat to live at and it's always like and I, I come to this the end of this verse I must give it a, and I'm down here with it I'm down here with it my father was an Irishman and they used to dig um, peat from the bog for the fire and um, he used to tell me that when him and his brothers they'd have to do it they'd go out with wheelbarrows and he used to say when we went out in the morning we were all like this with a wheelbarrow he says, when we got home, we were all like this. <laughs> as the day went on, the wheelbarrow got lower and lower as they got weaker and weaker. And you know, that can often be the way it seems. We set off thinking, we're going to do this all right, we're all right, and, we've got to... and then we seem to fail. The word of God says, go on that attitude, that behavior, that's got to stop. And you go down and down and down. And it, it almost sounds like, well, I've had it. <coughs> What hope have I got if I've got to give an account? But in the next verse, he says, therefore, just when I'm down here with my wheelbarrow, he says, drop that barrow and you'll stand up straight because, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firm to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Oh, isn't that lovely? Yes, the Word of God reminds me where I failed. The Word of God will redirect me. The Word of God will teach me. The Word of God is seeking to produce Christ in me. And the thought of giving an account, I think, how will I survive that? Because even as a Christian, I've not been very good, let alone before I was a Christian. How will I survive it? What hope is there for a person like me? And I've got to say, like you. This is the hope. We have a high priest who sympathizes. He says, Gordon, I understand. He doesn't condone, but he's sympathetic to my humanity and to my, my humanness. He's sympathetic because he was tempted, it says there. Do have a high who is able who, who is an enter. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So he said, Gordon, I was there. I was at that point you were at, and I chose not to sin, but sadly, Gordon, you did. 
but he's my high priest. He died for my sins. Mm -hmm. And he steps forward and I am forgiven because of what he has done. He acknowledges it. Sin is not swept under the carpet. It's not a matter of, oh, just forget it, it doesn't matter because Gordon's a regional superintendent. You know, as if that matters to God at all. He acknowledges my weakness. He acknowledges my failure. And he comes in and because he's a high priest, he's gone into God's presence to offer himself as my sacrifice. But we have... But we have one who has been tempted in every such way, yet without sin. And there, here's the good news. This should cheer you up. After you think, oh, I'll, tell you, I'll never pick my Bible up again. <laughs> because it's going, to, it's going to judge me. Of course it's going to judge you. It's living, it's active, it's God's word. But at the end of the day, we come to verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace. Oh, no, I don't want to. I don't want to approach. Let us approach the throne, pardon me. Let us, no, I don't want to approach the throne. I don't want to stand before God because I know how a failure I am. I know the Bible has been reminding me of the things I need to improve on. It's been dividing, sowing out. And I, I don't want to approach this throne. Then it reminds us what the throne is. Let us approach the throne of grace. Isn't that lovely? Mercy, grace. God forgives. I walk up to that throne, acknowledging all my failure, saying, I am without excuse, Lord. He says, it don't matter, Gordon. Remember the cross. Does that mean I can live as I want? Does that mean I can go out and rob the banks and do all the terrible... No, 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 no. The word of God's reminding me. I've got to seek to live a life that pleases him so that when I give an account, I might get a couple of ticks in the box. You know, I often wonder whether God did a school report of me, what it would say. You know, works well under supervision. <laughs> I used to get my school report in school. And the school report had come home and my mother would cry. My father would come home and I'd cry. And I'd say, you know, my mother would be in prison now, boys, you know what she did to me. used to bail the day. Anyway, it didn't make any, didn't affect me at all. Okay. So nothing is uncovered lay there, we know that. But we, that we may approach the throne of grace with confidence. And this is what we're going to receive. We're going to receive mercy. And we're going to find grace to help us in our time of need. So you think time of need is, oh, I'm broke or I'm sick. No, no, it's more than that. When we are aware that we're not what we should be, his grace and mercy to help us in a time of need. When you failed, when that attitude, that, that response to a situation was unworthy of Christ. And you know it. There's grace and there's mercy to help us in our time of need. Oh yes, the Bible's going to say, Gordon, no, no, that's not acceptable. Or, well done, Gordon, you got that wrong last time, you got it right this time. Well done. The Bible's active, it's a sword, it's coming in, it's sorting me out and everything else. And then I've got to give an account and I'm coming up to the judgment seat of Christ and I'm thinking, I've, I've had it. Then I remember the cross and I remember that, every, that I have there mercy and fine grace. Mercy and grace. I don't know what they're going to say at your funeral. They won't be saying a lot at mine because there'll be very few people there because I'm restricting the attendance. <laughs> But um, wouldn't it be nice if they said of us, do you know what, he couldn't preach, but he was, he, he was a man of mercy and grace. I'd be happy with that. Mm -hmm. So well, he was a regional superintendent, he spoke at the camp and he did this. Couldn't give two hoops. But it could be said that I received mercy and I received grace. Mm -hmm. And I also gave mercy yeah. and gave, be gracious to one another. Mm -hmm. So, oh, well, they're really annoying me. Well, maybe you annoyed God. So why don't you forgive them as Christ has forgiven you? None of us are the finished product. But we've got to make some progress, haven't we? Let's pray. You've listened ever so well. Thank you. Lord, I thank you for this lovely church. I thank you for...
Pastor Johnny, we thank you, Lord, for Joe and the family. We thank you for the leadership they've given here over a number of years now. We thank you for the leaders of this church. I won't try and remember them all by name, but we thank you for them. I thank you for their coming to Leeds the other day. It was a great, a great encouragement for me to see them there. I just thank you that they blessed me more than I've ever blessed them. Lord, we cannot believe that you've planted this church here for us to do no more than we're doing. We believe you have great things planned. We want to be part of your plan. We're not claiming to be the only church in this area, but we certainly want to be involved in your will and in your projects, Lord. So guide us and help us, I pray. Amen. Amen.